So thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you, Francesco, for inviting me to this uh, brilliant meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so this is the title of my talk. Stefan asked me to talk only about Scrub the Hub, but I'm gonna talk about a few other techniques as well. I actually use this one. Uh, so I have no financial relationship to disclose. I think that's quite important to point out as I will speak about some um, commercially available products. Uh, so let's start out with a poll. Um, do you think that it is possible to prevent late onset, late onset neonatal sepsis? And the alternatives are, yes, good hygiene can prevent late onset sepsis. Or no, preemies have a poor immune system and are subjected to invasive procedures. Antibiotics and antifungals is the only way to save them. So I don't know if it's up, Stefan. Is it working? Yeah, yeah. We have already 28 answers. Okay, good. Good, very good. Okay, Stefan, I'm leaving. <laughs> I have nothing more to say. Uh, no, but of course that is a very good answer, and I think that is the start to, to if you want to address this question, you must have uh, this sense that you can do something about this, this problem. Uh, so I'm very happy with that answer. So the question then is, what should we do? And we've already seen a lot of Cochrane data and Cochrane analysis, so I tried to squeeze not all of them, but many of them into one slide. And uh, I was very happy to see that Janet Barrington, uh, she helped me out with uh, the probiotica uh, Cochrane's that I did not include here. But as you can see, uh, most of these uh, they don't end up with any recommendations. This is a very quick slide, we cannot talk about all of them, but uh, prophylactic antibiotics for different sorts of umbilical or central lines uh, are not recommended. Prophylactic vancomycin, not recommended. Prophylactic antibiotics if you have an intercostal catheter. Topical emol uh, emollients and the IV, um, IG for prevention of infections small effect, but they don't recommend it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this early rem removal. That is, if, you've al if you already have sepsis, uh, should you remove uh, the central line uh, very early? Uh, they couldn't give a recommendation on that one. So the only one where there actually is a recommendation is prophylactic antifungals in very low birth weight infants. And I think many of, of you are aware of it, and uh, some of you are probably using it also. So. Uh, not m much uh, answers there, but, but there is things that you can do, and I think this is fairly evident that, that you can prevent uh, neonatal sepsis, and these are just some, some uh, examples of it. These, this is CDC data that, that shows that uh, over the years in the U.S. you, you have pre prevented a lot of sepsis cases, and this one is now fairly historical, but I think it's Connecticut. And you see the huge drop when they did different uh, hygiene uh, improvements. And this is probably the most important one, um, where they did a collaboration in the state of, of New York. So it's not only the city of New York, but the entire state. So huge area, and, and many NICUs collaborated. And they managed to decrease the sepsis rate by 40%. So, so really brilliant work. And, and what we all, of course, ask ourselves, what did they do? Well. Uh, the data is out there, uh, there's a few simple steps that we should all make. We should work very hard and very thoroughly with our basic hygiene measures. We should avoid crowding in the NICU, and that is that we should avoid crowding uh, of the babies, but we should uh, not crowd the nurses, but there should be a sufficient staff to treat the babies that are in the NICU. And we should of course train the staff, uh, um, have education and training and different uh, quality improvement projects. Uh, and, and we should do this by using checklists and by using bundles. And uh, for those of you that don't understand the, the, the word bundle, a bundle is uh, like the pencils here, they are kept together. Uh, so that is, by meaning that, uh, the meaning is that you do 
a bunch of things together. You mm -hmm. don't start an, a quality improvement with just hand washing. Mm -hmm. You create a bundle with a series of different uh, measures that should be applied. And by doing a lot of stuff, uh, hopefully some of them will work, and you will get good results. So these bundles, uh, this is the example of the New York study that I talked about earlier. And this is not rocket science. I mean, this is stuff that most of you already do or that you can do in any, in any NICU that, uh, or probably not in Aleppo, but if you have resources like we have in the Western world, you can, mm -hmm. you can do this stuff. Uh, to put all the stuff together uh, and, and create a kit cart um, so that you have all the stuff you need when you should put the uh, central line. Please wash your hands, put, a, put, put on a gown and a mask and so on. Disinfect the skin with the appropriate technique and, uh, and uh, use the correct dressing. Uh, so that is for ins insertion and when you uh, want to maintain your catheter, uh, you should wash your hands for that as well. You should evaluate the catheter insertion site daily and, and if you have a damp or soil of the dressing, you should uh, exchange it. And there's a, a few other um, techniques here, but then at the end here, you can see that you should maintain an aseptic technique when you're, uh, when you're changing into venous tubing. And when entering the catheter, you should use some, something that's called scrub the hub. And if you don't need the catheter, please take it out as soon as possible. So uh, I had I had my uh, my background is in diagnostic stuff this on, on sepsis and I always went to meeting where where uh, they had different talks about how to prevent sepsis and they all talked about scrub the hub and I never understood what they talked about so uh, now I have a poll with you here are you familiar with scrub the hub and you have three alternatives yes we use it at my unit. Yes, we don't use it, or I'm unsure <laughs> at how we do at my unit. Or the third, uh, scrub the what? You don't understand. And please uh, give me your the truthful answer. Uh, this is anonymous. And if you want to hedge your bet, you can put one bet on your mobile phone and another on your laptop, so you can cover all the bases. <laughs> Okay, third, okay, so 74% uh, of you know what it is, which is very good, and some of you need an explanation. So, Stefan, I have a job here. <coughs> Very good. Uh, so, uh, I'll try to explain this for you. So, a hub, uh, this is Wikipedia, since I'm not English speaking from the beginning. A hub is the central part of a wheel. Uh, på svenska så säger vi att det är ett nav. So it's the central part of a, a wheel, and when we talk about it in, in medical uh, or in the NICU, we talk about the three-way stopcock. And of course, it's not uh, the hub in the middle that needs to be cleaned. You need to clean the insertion site where you uh, connect your syringe. Uh, so that is uh, the explanation of, of a hub. And uh, the scrubbing is a repeated rubbing of uh, the membrane where you connect your syringe. So if you repeatedly uh, uh, rub this needleless connector or, or this uh, uh, area where the syringe goes, that's what we call um, scrub the hub. There is no set definition for how long you should be doing this, but if you want to perform a correct scrub the hub technique, normally we talk about something more than just swiping uh, the connector once. Uh, and this results in a chemical uh, disinfection, since we use some kind of alcohol to, to get rid of the bacteria. But there's also a, a very mechanical uh, cleaning of the membrane. Uh, if you want to see how this is done, there's several uh, videos on YouTube or in the internet that you can watch. We've made one in Swedish uh, on my hospital that, that you can uh, take a look at if you want. But if you want an American or in any other language, there are several of them. One, can, one could speculate that this is even more important in uh, a bacteria that uh, creates biofilm. And as you all know, co-negative staph has the uh, uh, potential uh, biofilm uh, uh, 
capability, and co-negative stuff is also uh, the largest problem in the modern, modern NICU. So if you have, have a lot of co-negative stuff in your NICU, this might be a, a good way to get rid of them. So uh, how about the current recommendation? Is this something that I'm just uh, talking about, or is this something that other people feel is important? Uh, David Sweet uh, instructed us very good about how uh, different categories of uh, recommendation, and so uh, that's very good. We learned that yesterday. And uh, CDC, the big organization in the US, they put uh, the, the use of needle nest injection valves and uh, that they should be, be, be scrubbed, they put that as a category 1A. And they are very rigorous with their scientific recommendations, so they don't give a recommendation if you should scrub the, the, uh, the injection valve for 2 seconds or 5 seconds or 15 seconds or 30 seconds. And I think that's very wise because there is no evidence um, for how long you should scrub them. If you look at the Swedish recommendations, they are in, in uh, different uh, words uh, recommended by, by Social Studies and, and the Swedish um, Society for Intensive Care and Vårdhandboken, which is a website where we go uh, to, to check how we work in the health care system in Sweden. Uh, so, how about this question, who is how long should we scrub the membrane to make sure that it is really clean? Well, uh, do, we need, do we actually have to prove this? I mean, the problem is that th we cannot see the bacteria. If uh, the bacteria were visible to the naked eye, like, like these dishes here are, we could just tell the nurses, please, uh, uh, we will scrub this membrane until it looks clean. And it would be fantastic if that also worked on our hands. Mm -hmm. If we could see uh, the bacteria in the world, we wouldn't have all these problems. Unfortunately, we don't know that, so we need to uh, decide, uh, uh, set up rules for hand washing and for keeping our central lines clean. One way to get around this or to, to make an example of this was these guys uh, from Johns Hopkins, they just put some paint on, on uh, fluorescent paint on different connectors and then scrub them for different uh, time uh, series. And uh, the longer you scrub something, the cleaner it gets. And if you've ever done dishes looking like, that, like this, you already know that. You, the more you clean something, the cleaner it gets. The problem is we don't know how dirty it is to start with. Uh, I think I'm going to go to this one first. Uh, but if uh, we go to, to the different lab studies, we have uh, uh, in vitro data that shows us that if you, uh, if you uh, put a lot of bacteria on a hub like this, and then uh, you scrub it for, for uh, three seconds, 10 seconds, five seconds, the longer you clean it, the cleaner it gets. So even for bacteria, these very basic rules uh, apply. And if I just, um, and I'm just going to uh, pop back to some basic uh, bacteria knowledge. I'm going to talk a little bit about blood agar, uh, like that you can see like this. Of course, all of you know that any of these dots that you can see they were started with one single bacteria. And you know that if we give bacteria the right um, environment, they will uh, multiply very fast. And as you know, these blood agar plates, they are constructed uh, in a way so that the bacteria can uh, multiply as best as they can. And they put every good stuff in uh, th these plates and uh, I mean they even put chocolate in them sometimes to make the bacteria grow really well but still the bacteria they don't expand all over they make one rounded colony and then they stop to grow and that is not because they are bored or they don't want to go other places or so on it's just because there are so many in a small sp uh, space so they, uh, 
run out of nutrients. They run out of energy and they cannot multiply anymore. But if you take this and you want to build a machine of how to get many bacteria, it would be very nice to have somewhere where it's pretty damp, it's in a body tem temperature like uh, 37 degrees, and you could have a flow of nutrients flowing there, like in a central line. So if you have a central line, you have the perfect uh, damp environment, and you have a constant flow of water, of glucose, of fat, of proteins. Everything that's good for a baby is basically good for a bacteria. And you have a plastic surface there, so your favorite bacteria, like the co-negative staff, they can all cling on to this plastic surface, and they can sit there on the plastic surface, and then they can just start to multiply. And as soon as the, they become too many, so that they don't all get <laughs> this uh, good nutrient that we are sending through, they could, by quorum sensing, just tell a few of their buddies to, hey guys, just leave and, and, and go with the flow and carry on somewhere else. So uh, now we've turned this fantastic culturing machine to a machine gun. And it just shoots millions and millions of bacteria into the circulations because these bacteria are sitting inside the intravenous line. Mm. So if you have dirty hands like I have today with rings on it and so on, I would much rather stick my finger into a wound of a patient because there, uh, there is... Um, uh, the innate immune system. Even if the preemies have a poor immune system, they have an immune system. So if I put one bacteria there, uh, we have pretty good chances that, that the immune system will take care of this. But if I put my dirty thumb on a syringe and then connect it to the central line, and this bacteria gets stuck inside the central line, then we have this perfect storm for bacteremia. Okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, go on to some clinical evidence that scrub the hug actually work. This, this is adult patient and this is three uh, different adult uh, ICUs, I think this is uh, Chicago. And what they did here, uh, they wanted to see if scrub the hub worked and to monitor how much uh, they scrub uh, their hubs they used a special alcohol pad that was a uh, single package and then monitored how many single packages the, uh, the, the nurses used. And you can see uh, these um, lines here, the, the dark line and, and the little bit thinner line, that's the septic, sepsis rate and this is um, uh, the use of these alcohol pads. And you can see on all the three slides as the alcohol pads go up, the sepsis rate goes down and it's the same on, on all three uh, NICU. So I think this is one of the best studies that shows that, that, this, um, that this method actually uh, works uh, by its own. Uh, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about my study that I think maybe is the, the reason that Stefan invited me. And this is a study that I did at my hospital, uh, Urbu University Hospital, that's located 200 kilometers from here. And what we did was that we did a, a non-randomized inter intervention study, meaning that we used historic controls, and we first defined the control period, and then we had the study period. And uh, for an outcome, we used uh, neonatal co-negative co -negative staph sepsis, and the reason uh, for using only co-negative staph is that, in my opinion at least, the only way you can get a co-negative staph sepsis is through an IV line. Somebody yesterday <coughs> said that, that neonatal sepsis, that's either from the gut or it's from the line. And the, the co-negative uh, staph is uh, it's such a weak bacteria, it cannot get into the body in any other way. Uh, and the, the other thing that we did that uh, we, uh, because you all know that with co-negative staph, some of the, uh, the cases will be a contaminated blood culture and some of them will be true uh, sepsis cases. So we blinded the person that decided if this was sepsis or contamination. So it was blinded from uh, during what period um, the case came from. 
And uh, this is the material that we collected. Um, it's nothing strange about it. It's a pretty small center. And as uh, in most uh, centers that don't have many referrals, many patients were, were fairly large. And this is the results that we had. Uh, before we, we, uh, and, uh, we started using Scrub the Hub, we had uh, a, a few sepsis cases but we also had a few uh, contamination or contaminated blood cultures. And as uh, we expected, when we started using Scrub the Hub, we continued to get the contaminated blood cultures because if I treat the, the umbilical line very well, that doesn't uh, prevent bacteria from going into a blood culture that's, that's drawn from an, another vein. Uh, so we still had the contaminate blood cultures, but we didn't see one single uh, sepsis case, which of course uh, made us thrilled. So if you uh, put some mathematics to this, um, you, you get a pretty large uh, risk reduction, but uh, the data is not significant. Uh, you could uh, then argue, is this cost effective, uh, or you could at least speculate, is it cost effective or not? And uh, we know that the sepsis case costs about 10,000 US dollars, and that is because we need to work with a septic baby a lot more than with a non-septic baby. So uh, then you can say that, <coughs> like in our study, we, we avoided uh, half a case per month, and that would save us 5,000 US dollars, and that uh, equals to one full-time nurse in Sweden. Or if you are afraid that you should run out of uh, chlorhexidine, you can buy 297 liters of chlorhexidine for those money. Uh, I think maybe this study has received a little bit more attention than it should have. Uh, you must uh, remember that this is a non-randomized trial. Uh, the, the results are non-significant and it's from a single center. And you always have that problem with regression to mean. Uh, of course, as you saw, I had a lot of septic, septic cases before I started the study and you can always with fluctuation have these results. So that's why I'm in the picture. This is one of those small studies that it's just me and my babies. And it shouldn't be overinterpreted. It should be interpreted with the other data that, uh, that says that this, this is an effective method. Uh, and then, of course, what happened, happened after the study? Of course, we continued the scrub period, but uh, sepsis cases started to come back, as many others have seen when they've done small studies like this. Mm. So what did we do uh, after that? We tried to take this to a national uh, level. We were very uh, inspired by the Canadians that do this great uh, epic work. And we wanted to see if, if we could uh, improve uh, the infection rate in Sweden. And the goal was to reduce the number of sepsis cases by 50% in two years. And uh, the end of the study period was uh, December 2016. And I have I've seen the preliminary data, but it seems like we couldn't get this great effect on the national level. Um, one could speculate if uh, the intervention was not uh, effective, or maybe we didn't implement it uh, well enough. So I'm going to go a little bit from Scrub the Hub to uh, port protectors or alcohol impregnated caps. Uh, that is a technique, another technique to keep, uh, to keep your um, valves clean. And uh, um, there are two different uh, types of them available on the market. They're called Swap Cap and Curos. And I'm going to see here if I can show you how they work. So this is a, this is a yellow um, um, valve. It's good to use the yellow one when you... Uh, so you have these uh, uh, caps. They are sterile like this. And you just open them up and you have a little sponge inside the cap. And you squeeze it on. Your, and you can almost see and hear the alcohol uh, getting out from the sponge. And now you have a sterile seal uh, around this, this valve and you have a lot of alcohol uh, around the valve. And you can keep it like this for seven days until you want to use uh, this valve again. And then you just open it up like that and it should be clean. 
So that is, of course, um, a very, uh, very smart idea. And you can see here that there's a sponge here, and that is where the alcohol comes from. So I have another poll for you. Are you familiar with alcohol caps? And you can choose, uh, yes, we use them at my unit. Or, yes, I'm familiar, but we don't use them. Or, no, I've never heard of them. Okay, so pretty mixed, about 50-50. Some of you have heard of it, and some of you haven't heard of them. And so uh, I'm going to try to give you my view on these uh, caps. Uh, the first publications came in 2006 and 2008, and they were tested on uh, three different uh, injection valves, and they used uh, ton of bacteria, uh, 8 over 10 with Enterococcus faecalis, and they dipped their, their valves into that and tried to clean them. And that's actually the data where I showed you where the valves didn't get clean after, after 15 seconds of scrubbing. Of course, if it's that contaminated, it's almost like dipping it into <coughs> the feces and then trying to get it clean. Of course, you need to clean it very, for a very long time. Um, and I don't know why they published it twice. Maybe they really wanted the world to know about it. Uh, and this uh, publication, if you, if you dip it into uh, 8 over 10 <coughs> into caucus, uh, this swab cap technique cleans uh, the valve better than scrub the hub. Uh, this is a clinical study that I think is very well done. This is four different ICUs in Chicago. And uh, they... Uh, um, started using these uh, swab caps and uh, during their intervention uh, the sepsis rate uh, went down and then they ended the intervention and the sepsis rate, the clapsy rate went up again. So, uh, and it prevented uh, 21 sepsis cases and four deaths in six months. So a pretty significant effect. No, there's no effect because it's not significant. Uh, well, That's a misunderstanding. Well, uh, we will get to the meta-analysis. Uh, it, it is a clinical significant effect, but maybe not statistical. Uh, this is another study uh, um, that's from an uh, oncology unit, and uh, they had this effect. And you can see uh, um, that there were quite a lot of, of uh, collapses before and after the intervention, at least uh, a lot less, and not one single co-negative staff uh, during the intervention. But uh, of course, uh, as in most studies, larger studies should be performed. Uh, these are uh, uh, some of the neonatal data that uh, are available, or I should rather say they're not available because these are posters and different abstracts from, from meeting that I haven't attended, but I've received the abstracts. Uh, I can just uh, I can just say that um, I'm uh, of course familiar very, with the Vermont Oxford uh, network, and, and if they do stuff, I think it's good. But again, these data have not been uh, referee uh, uh, ha hasn't been uh, gone through a, a referee process yet, or at all. Uh, but then uh, a meta analysis uh, came. Uh, that uh, favors uh, the barrier cap. This is very new. They came out just a few uh, months ago. So you can see some of the studies here. Uh, if if we, we should discuss if they're statistical significant or not. Some of them are just touching, and some of them are to the left. But the meta analysis at least favors the caps. So uh, I was actually very. Uh, Hopeful. I didn't. I, I. I was hopeful, and I wanted to do a large randomized trial on the on these caps. I didn't want to put them in standard care straight away. Uh, but there is also uh, something that we should be uh, aware of, and that is that this alcohol that they're using is quite toxic. Uh, there is a death of a baby where the mother tried to uh, uh, wash the umbilical stump uh, with isopropanol 
and isopropanol is uh, very easily uh, absorbed uh, by the skin, so the baby actually died. And uh, if you get it into the body, it can uh, accumulate uh, acetone and create a metabolic acidosis. And of course, there are no sort of toxicological studies on, on newborns. And uh, if this isopropanol could leak through these valves, we could get a, a low level intoxication during several weeks. And nobody knows what effect that would have on, on uh, uh, severely ill uh, ICU patient or even more dangerous, uh, a NICU patient. And I put the evil eye of Sauron on this picture uh, because I, uh, I don't want to make fun of anybody's name, but I wanted to put it on there so that you should remember the name of the, this brilliant group uh, where the first name actually is Sauron. And if you were brought up in a home where J.R.L. Tolkien is rather considered religion and not, uh, not literature, you should acknowledge this. So uh, I'm, I don't want to make a joke about this. If any of you know these guys, please tell them I, I love their study. Uh, the, this group, they actually showed that if uh, they put these uh, alcohol caps uh, on um, the smart site uh, valve, they get a lot of isopropanol on the other side. And nobody knows what's the toxic level, uh, but so they did a theoretical uh, uh, sort of argue that uh, 14 millimolar per liter, uh, that could be a toxic level. And you see several samples there, way above that line. Uh, so we wanted to uh, continue this and check the, the valves that are in use in, in Sweden. So these are very preliminary data that were uh, presented by my brilliant PhD student, Luis birkman Marchand, just a few weeks ago in San Francisco on a poster. And um, we got similar results. We have several, you can see here, we have several um, samples that are way above 14 uh, millimolars per liter. So uh, we can uh, confirm uh, what uh, Sauron found and uh, we can say that we are concerned about the safety about these products and um, of course uh, if a small amount of alcohol leaks uh, through a valve like this that is much more uh, dangerous if the patient weighs 500 grams than if the patient would weigh 75 kilos so my take-home messages are that prophylactic antibiotics are, is not recommended if you want to do something about your sepsis rate, please use checklists and bundles. Scrub the hub is a safe, cheap, and most probably effective method. And alcohol caps seems to be effective, but the safety is questionable. So thank you very much. This is uh, my, my uh, email address, but also the name of a Facebook group uh, that I have. And believe it or not, there's almost uh, 700 Swedes and Norwegians that would like to discuss this topic online. So if you, uh, if you want to join, you're free to join. It is in Swedish, but uh, most of the links and articles and so on are, of course, in English. Great. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you.